Ronan, you just put out a film about Jordan Peterson, contrasting him with Russell Brand and seeing what the left can learn from Jordan Peterson. It's become more important to display loyalty to our political tribe than it is to understand a person or an issue in all of its complexity. I'm Ronan Harrington and I'm exploring the new politics that's on the other side of this culture war. And I see Jordan Peterson as a test case for getting there. And it's one of a few things I've seen um, from people on the left who seem to be kind of uh, asking that question. But also, I think there's a sense with some people on the left that they still don't want to have that conversation. Did you feel nervous about doing it? And what were your conclusions from doing the project? Yeah, I mean, I was pretty sick with anxiety in like the weeks leading up to it because I am from a, probably like a traditional left activist circle where um, there's a real allergy to Peterson, if you want to just put it softly. Um, and what we wanted to do was maybe ask what is a yes and to Peterson? Like what is an approach that honors his strengths and really kind of recognizes the contribution that he's made, but also from our perspective point to the gaps in his thinking. Um, but even a tacit acknowledgement of those strengths there was the fear that that would be seen as, on some level, a, a betrayal. And that did play out in some of the comments to the video. We had a broadly positive response. We had people say, like, thank God, a refreshing critique from a left perspective that isn't just dismissing outright, that there's some attempt to engage. But it was really nice the way you framed it. Like, we're, we're te especially in social media, we're tempted to say, to make an either or judgment all the time. Yeah, well this is the, the in a way the video was about Jordan Peterson's thinking, but it, on a more meta level it was a commentary on our political culture. So we face this um, enormous pressure to either love or hate either public figures or issues or to endorse them and to reject them and to be very public in that. Um, but people and issues are really complex and with someone like Jordan Peterson I can see lots of, as I said in the video, profound contributions and strengths and also areas where I feel like his thinking is really off. And how can you hold that complexity in a tribal polarized culture where you're kind of shot down for holding it? And I think that that maybe is the new political space that's opening up is more and more people willing to go like, no, I'm not going to just fall into a binary. I'm going to try and stay open and hold the complexity. Mm. Yeah, it's something that we've talked about before on our podcast is that hold the, the kind of the, the test of sort of maturity in a way is holding tr many truths at the same time and not necessarily sort of saying this is true but this is also true yeah. um, and it seems that we're at a place this is also sort of the intellectual dark web for me is kind of like is it possible to think in public and thinking in public is very different from kind of reacting to things mm -hmm. and I hope I, I think I think you're probably right that now a space is starting to open up for that kind of dialogue, whereas maybe it wasn't or hasn't been. Because also the sense that the mainstream media doesn't necessarily allow that to happen. If everything has to be fitted into a five minute soundbite or whatever, there's not really a lot of time to unpack ideas and develop conversations. And it feels that there is a space opening up for, for the possibility of, of genuine thinking in public, which I guess is really an interesting place to be. Yeah, and if you can try and create a space that isn't from the get-go pushing people's buttons and triggers that puts them into this defensive mode, if you really try and honor and, 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 and it's, it's the basis of a pre of inquiry, it's the basis of therapy, it's that you don't start with attacking someone, you start with really honoring them and giving them a space to be seen and then from that place it's like, okay, I'm, I'm more open. And that's what we found in the comments is that with that acknowledgement of Peterson, which is I think what Peterson fans are looking for. I don't think that they mind critiques per se. It's more that there's also an acknowledgement of him and not just an outright rejection. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I think what's often interesting is it obviously is in this space, it's not just the video. The video is the stimulus. And actually what was interesting to notice was just did the tone or the, or the, com or the conversation change? Did it become more generative? And I think that that's probably where we should be trying to get to. Yeah, that's a really interesting point as well about, firstly about that we can only start to inquire from a place of safety, which is absolutely true. And actually, if you, like Peterson talks about this and Ian McGilchrist talks about this, we have two systems. We have one system, and this is polyvagal theory, if you want to kind of look at how, that, what's going on underneath. We're either in a defensive mode and we're not able to grow, or we're in an inquiring, um, explorative mode, and then we can grow. And actually, you're right, political discussions have to respect that as well.
And I, th I think you're also right when you say that what turns off Peter, I, I'd count myself a Peterson, Peterson admirer, certainly admirer of, of his work. I don't like the word fan. I think that's, that's a really dangerous energy to bring to anything. Because um, I've also, we've, we've also put out some podcasts sort of critiquing what we see as some of his blind spots. But I think what turns me off and what turns off a lot of other people who admire his work is the energy that comes through in a lot of the criticisms. Like you read things from, from reporters that just say charlatan, fraud, or, and, and you read it and you just think, okay, there may be things that he's not, he's not seeing or he's got blind spots, as everyone does, but the energy in much of the criticism is just so off that I think it really makes a lot of people who've become extremely f familiar, this is the other thing, people have become deeply familiar with his work over a long time, usually at their own, in their own time. So when they see this coming out in the media, they just think, okay, there's something off about, about the way that he's being critiqued. But what's interesting is that that also needs to be met with the same energy of that person being seen and understood. It, that, that, pr that principle goes all the way down. So in this case, the people who respond and say he's a charlatan, he's a misogynist, he's a fascist, it's like, what's going on there? Like, what aspect of, of them are feeling unsafe that would lead to a very reactive response instead of open curiosity and I think that behind that is a whole set of emotional needs and so I think that at its best it's pointing to a form of political engagement that basically doesn't immediately dismiss but actually inquires into what's the thing behind the thing. Yes, people mightn't be open to that but it, I still think there's an opportunity to model um, that as a general principle even if someone is unwilling to engage with it because I think that if you take let's say writers and feminist circles, they have red lines around if there is um, a feeling that there is sexism, there is misogyny, there's an undermining of, let's say, black rights movements, and, and, and whether or not Peterson is transgressing them is another thing, but that if there is the feeling of that, clearly that activates a very strong no. Um, and I think that I've been thinking a lot about this in terms of, you know, the left's relationship with identity politics and there's a lot of talk about, you know, it needs to get its house in order, it needs to reject it and, and move into a, a space that more people can get on board with it. But the question is, is the politics that we need nowadays a kind of a reject or is it a can we try and integrate, can we can include, can we listen to the, the, the genuine feelings that are there that lead people to believe that the world can be primarily understood as an oppressive system where there is an oppressor class and there is an oppressed. And even if that analysis is wrong, there are clearly personal experiences, there are clearly emotions there that have to be dealt with because they don't go away. It's like you, you know, it's, um, you're just rejecting it back into the shadows in a way. And I, so I, I, maybe I, I'm curious like, how do we do that? How, how do we bring what is a therapeutic approach to political conversation? Um, and, and is it possible? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting because one of our criticisms of, or critiques of Jordan Peterson was that he is too reactive, that he is subject to a lot of these kind of uh, relentless uh, attacks from the media, but that he, our point was, if, if he starts getting into reactivity and response, then a lot of people are not going to hear his message. They're just going to see angry white man. And when we put that critique out, there were quite a few people commenting and saying, you're, you're just blaming the victim because he's just reacting. He's being attacked relentlessly. And you're saying, and effectively we were saying, we were asking for an almost superhuman level of, of, of transcendence from him. Mm. And that almost nobody would have been able to, to maintain under the, under the weight of so many of the mischaracterizations and stuff that we see from the media. So it's like, if we're asking for, I, I, I think you're right. Like I've, I've, I've thought this for a while that you, we do need to introduce some form of political therapy into the discourse. It's like, okay, what's really going on? What are, what are the, the experiences that have led you to, because our political views are almost always a reflection of a deeper psychological reality. And I think unless we make space for that psychological reality, there's no hope of, of any kind of generative dialogue or, or real meeting. But we're asking an awful lot of people to be able to do that. I think, personally, I think all, all we can do is create a space where that, create a space where that is the dominant frame that is then 
that it, you create the space that's the dominant frame and then other people can come into it. But un understanding that not everyone will be able to do that and maybe that isn't a frame that is appropriate for everybody. And at some point, if people have like wounds that mean that they're really not able to engage in generative dialogue, then accept that inclusivity only goes so far. And this is a big problem on the left, I think, is wanting to have a space that's completely inclusive of absolutely everything. But then if you're including people who are not able to respect the, the ground rules of what an inclusive general, generative dialogue means, then I think that's where the left gets into trouble. Because it's not very good at policing boundaries around, around the ground rules of its own generative dialogue. And then it gets hijacked very, very quickly. Like left spaces are notorious for being hijacked by people with the, with the most kind of keenly felt agendas. And they're often the most pathological agendas or they're what, or they're the ones that come from the deepest sort of sense of wounding. It's like, how do you make space for that? Allow it to be processed. But if it can't be processed, then maybe it's not appropriate for them to be in that space. I, I don't know, but I think that's part of the, the narrative or the dynamic that comes in in a lot of these spaces. Because Peterson talks about this. It's like the left doesn't like boundaries, hates boundaries, hates hierarchies, hates boundaries. But it's, we need some boundaries to be able to have generative dialogues. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and I think you've described broadly the parameters of what that looks like. I just don't know how you can do that online on Facebook when the like button is determining most people's behavior. I do think we should expect it of Jordan Peterson. I think that if you rise to such a level of influence, there is this transition that you make from becoming the kind of the backbench politician to the statesman. And like statesmen, apart from Trump, behave differently when they're on the world stage. And, you know, I've, the thing that maybe I've been most allergic to is just the the degree to which there's such a rejection of young student activists who might be kind of in the throes of a particular uh, ideology that they mightn't be able to see, but they're also young students and they do mean well and they do see a very fucked up world and want to change it. And rather than, and particularly as a clinical psychologist, rather than taking what I might assume the like a kind of a, a, a fatherly or grandfatherly approach of really like seeing them and honoring them and then from that place of openness bringing them to a greater place of individuation a, a better relationship with ideology it's just like you are the curse of the world and it's like well yeah. well like god it's no wonder the left ha ha finds it difficult to get on board of peterson they're they're being shouted at and so I, I, it's interesting that I, you know the person that i see modeling this often the least is peterson even though in other forums, he's, I can see him very open to learning and in this dialogue. But when it comes to the left, it's just like... I, I think that I, I agree with you about all of those points. I think there's... The, the issue for me is... Because he says this also. It's like he says, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. Mm. So if that's true, then where is the compassion for people who are under the sway of a pernicious idea? And I, 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 I think part of that is that his trajectory so far has been in combat with the left. I mean, this was his, like his job was at risk. And then he was also, I think, quite quickly, because of the times we're in, pulled into one side of the culture war. And that worked for him for quite a while. And I agree. I do think that, it's, especially now, I kind of hope that there could be some more openness to, to dialogue with the left. Because I actually don't think he is... He, like he's, he's characterised as being on the right. I genuinely don't think he is. I think um, he, he is more of a centrist. And I think his, his natural sort of um, place of... If he hadn't been sort of pushed so far by, by a lot of the kind of... the media interactions that he's had, I think his natural place would have been midway between the two. But I think the, the optics and the way that he's sort of gotten success by pushing the kind of anti-SJW student politics thing has probably locked him into a little bit of a reactivity towards it. And maybe there's some kind of aftermath of the experience that he went in, went through in Toronto as well that comes out in the way that, because the way that he talks about the left is different from the way he talks about the right. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that there probably is some political PTSD going on with his experience in Toronto. And I think that in any dynamic, it's not just him being assailed and being reactive. He's also co-creating that dynamic and I do think that he has ridden the wave of anti-identity politics, anti-regressive left sentiment to get to this point and I think that what all of us are calling for is can there be a transcendence of that like in true developmental fashion can you know can Jordan Peterson 
reinvent and remake himself in order to unify more people. And but but maybe the but from what I see is that I don't see him being in a relationship to the left. Like the things that I would want to see from him is less skepticism about climate change, more like explicit critique of Trump. Like that there are certain like you know, I don't want to describe it as a, 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 a box ticking exercise, but there are things that we would need to hear on the left in order to feel like, oh, this person speaks for us. And I, I but, rarely but I still, see that. Yeah, but my, my, my thing is, I still don't think the left is at any point ready to meet him. That's my, my problem, because I, I even see like people, so obviously we're, we're deeply interested in sort of integral thinking, this, this idea of yes and. And I don't see, even when I see kind of integral thinkers talking about being yes and with Peterson, the energy of it for me is not yes and. It's still rejecting or it's still saying, no, you're wrong about this. I, I'm not sure the left is yet. I think it's starting to have that conversation that might be able to kind of integrate what he's saying, but I don't see it happening yet. And I, don't, I think there's still, there's still work that needs to be done on both sides to be able to get there. Yes, definitely. I, but I, maybe, and this is an idea that came from Jonathan Rousen's essay, Critique, is that it is a yes and, or it is a both and, and it's an either or. So you can have a, a fully rounded position on Peterson's virtues, his weaknesses, and then come down on the side of, ultimately, I don't think you're a positive force in the world. Ultimately, I'm critical that you don't talk enough about structural problems and systemic issues. This is the theme of the video that we released was like, I would love to see Peterson talk about systems change. What needs to change on a structural level? I think in the interview that you've done with him, you've talked about the structural conditions for psychological growth. Like that's the territory I would love to see him move into. And also in terms of his um, like he's very male centric and, and I think that it's it's great that there's a public figure that is standing up for men but it also ideally it would take a progression towards being integrative and that women would also feel like he speaks for them because currently it's very easy just to see that he doesn't. We connected over a project called Alter Ego which is which is now your media channel and a couple of gatherings over the last couple of years do you want to sort of describe what the, what the framing of Alter Ego is? What, what's, what's the aim with Alter Ego? I think the framing of it now it began as this idea that progressive politics is in crisis. It is a crisis of ideas. and that's Controversial. <laughs> and that spirituality is the place to look for answers. That, that we're missing, that there's just a kind of a limit to what we can do with materialism and that there is a kind of a transcendent possibility with spirituality that can renew progressive politics. And like seeing movements on the right who are well equipped with mystical language and kind of more visceral embodied narrative. Um, what it's turned into though is more of a project that's been inspired by integral thinking or developmental thinking. So I think in one sense is trying to promote a developmental shift both in society recognizing the importance of psychological growth but also that the psychological elements actually start to be integrated into political discussion. That we make the personal political, that we understand the ways in which our psychology our shadow, um, our biases frame how we see the world and that by actually you know growing in that domain we can actually outgrow those our problems or, or expand our way of seeing things. So that's the first shift, a developmental shift and the other is a dialectical shift. It's kind of realizing the limits of um, if only the left were more organized, communicated better, did better grassroots organizing that we would win and it's a recognition that hold on a second like there's a whole other half of the population that has just a different mixture of moral sentiments and like how do we actually integrate them? How do we bring them into a dialectic and find a synthesis? So it's an attempt to both bring a developmental shift and a dialectical shift. And we've been doing that through gatherings and bringing people together to have those discussions for better or worse. And now the media channel is an attempt to model that kind of thinking in the, in the public space. And so the Russell Brand, Jordan Peterson, video was an attempt to go look here are two big public figures they're grounded in like real spiritual psychological ethos and yet they're on different points of the spectrum and they're in some kind of convivial dialogue let's let's use that as a starting point and make sense of where where they are and even though we did reach a conclusion on peterson that like from our perspective he doesn't go far enough we need more the idea more is just to give people 
a more expanded idea of the, the space and for them to form their own opinion. Because mm. I guess, I mean, we, we work together on a, one of the alter ego gatherings and this, this sort of general idea that we need to, to bring in a deeper level of political discussion, we need to reintegrate what I would have said back then, the, the spiritual, I think since, since um, really diving deeply into Jordan Peterson's thought, I'd now kind of recognise also the value of religion as well, which I hadn't done quite so much before. I think I really kind of understand the, the value of these kind of deep encoded stories and mythologies of spirituality rather than just the sort of the, transcendent the experience, experience, the transcendent experience. Yeah. Um, so that's been an interesting journey for me. And I also had a really real felt sense from the beginning of the project that there's a, there's a tension between, and this is also, we're in the UK, the, the, the British Labour Party as well came out of both Marx and Methodism, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a sense of, and, and there's a sense of what are your initial axioms? Because if, you, if you've come from a position of kind of like the Marxist idea that we're, we're mainly talking about material conditions, or you come from a, condi a, a place of, we're talking about a meaningful life, uh, a life that, that yeah, it's, 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 a, it's more of a, a spiritual or religious origin. It's like those two things, I think any conversation around this issue in progressive circles is going to have a slight awkward um, tension between those two things. Can I add another axiom that I think is really important in this, is that the Marxist materialist frame also has a power dynamic at its center. It's about capital versus labor, it's an oppressor class versus an oppressed, which yeah. like, I, I believe that analysis holds out. But with a spiritual perspective or a psychological perspective, there also is that realization that every person in that dynamic is suffering on some level. All of us are wounded, all of us are playing out dynamics from our childhood, and it adds in a, just more spaciousness around that and a possibility of some kind of resolution rather than the dominant frame in Marxism, which is counter-hegemony. And again, I also do believe there is a place for counter-hegemony and that there are powerful individuals and systems in place that are, that are damaging and they need to be um, um, contested. But I also think that one of the, the brilliant aspects of the spiritual is this greater compassion for the individual, no matter where position they occupy in the hierarchy. And I think this is, this is something that Jordan Peterson talks about and I really recognise as being a fundamental difference, is I think a lot of people implicitly accept a set of axioms without necessarily knowing that they do. And that for me is the issue with the identity politics left, is that they implicitly accept the axioms of collectivism. They implicitly accept the axioms of kind of Priva the, the language around sort of uh, white privilege and your, your, that your group identity is more important than your individual identity. And that happens at a very sort of subtle level. Whereas actually what Peterson for me is bringing back is a sense of no, we have to, a primary axiom, axiom has to be the divinity of the individual. And that's something that we've evolved over millennia and we're in danger of throwing that out with the bathwater because we have this very well-meaning idea that the, the dominant narrative should be oppression and we should be seeing, therefore we're seeing people through their group identity rather than their individual identity. So I, I would slightly disagree or at least maybe offer another perspective. So you have like Deleuze and Guattari who are like kind of famous postmodernist theorists who would say that the individual is dead and it's the individual. It's the transpersonal individual that lives in relational context. And the idea of this binary between the individual and the group and, the, and Peterson kind of really bringing the individual back, I think that it's a, it's a false dichotomy. And I think that we need to, I'm basically just introducing that as a, as a, more as a concept for us to, to hold rather than seeing the two things in tension. But it's like, for me, it's like, it's a both and. It's very clear that if the group becomes all important, that can lead to all kinds of uh, tyrannies and, and kind of the collective ethos sweeping over, like 20th century is like to, to some degree that story. And there is a need for individual agency within that. Um, but there also within that, that feels like it can become just very Ayn Randian, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It has this sense that it's the individual on their kind of Nietzschean journey of manifestation. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels very masculine, male-centric and, and maybe less feminine and relational. And I, and I, I don't have a conclusion on that. I'm yeah. more just introducing more frames. Well, for me, it's like it, it's an incomplete story. The individualism story is, for me, correct, but it's incomplete. 
like my sense, and this is from personal growth and my sort of spiritual journey, um, is that by going really, really deeply into my own process, like really identifying my own sort of limiting beliefs or my own kind of conditioning or my own wounds or whatever kind of, and as I have fixed those more and more, I feel in, in increasingly, um, firstly, that I feel more in a position of, of contact with other people. Like, I think that's the catch-22. I think that's the paradox, that we start to kind of decide, well, either it's individual or it's a collective, and we, the left prioritises the group and the right prioritises the individual. For me, the resolution is, no, it's only by really individuating, really going deeply into ourselves and really kind of becoming ourselves, giving birth to ourselves, as Jung talked about, then we have the potential for genuine contact and genuine collaboration. And if we jump to, to that space of, no, we're all, we're all part of the tribe and we can collaborate together, mm -hmm. often what comes out is real shadow stuff. And like it's, that, that for me is like the catch-22. We go deeply, deeply, deep into our own process and then we find we're all the same person looking out through different eyes. And it's a direct embodied feeling of connection rather than trying to kind of create this, this connection which maybe hasn't manifested naturally. Yeah, so I totally agree with all of that. <laughs> and I think that if we look at this from an evolutionary perspective, like why has Jordan Peterson come on the scene right now? Why has his message resonated so strongly? I like reject that it's purely because of fragile masculinity and you know this, you know the, the he's the intellectual we deserve. That's kind of the 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 the, the sentiment on the left. I, I do think that in a, from an integral perspective, it's a correction of a lower tier that the individual does have to individuate because if it just leaps straight to postmodernism, universal collectivism, it's lost. And so I do think that Peterson is a really necessary stage on the journey, but we need to move fast and we need to start in reintegrating that with greater and greater, I suppose, ultimately wholeness, both on an individual level, but also on a collective. Um, and maybe the danger is that, yes, we all have to go through our individual journey of self-actualization, but because that takes place within a broadly speaking individualistic culture, it, it's the classic critique of spirituality. It just ends up as narcissism. And, and again, this is a point that Jonathan Rousen raised in his paper, is that you know, the true self-actualization is often borne out in service to community, in service to the, the greater whole that you're a part of. And I suppose the question is, does, does Peterson's narrative orientate us towards that way? Do we see it resolving the systemic crises that we face in the world? And, and that's maybe where I feel like p potentially it doesn't go far enough. I think he would argue that if enough people got themselves together, then those systemic crises would, would be a lot easier to solve, which I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I also think that there is probably a place beyond him, um, which is kind of, I guess, what you're pointing to. Yeah. But I, but I really feel like we can't jump there. And I think most, m yeah, I, I think most of what we're seeing at the moment is a kind of jumping beyond, not, not doing the work, not doing the, the kind of the deep work of, of self-responsibility, of really kind of identifying. He said a couple of really interesting things in the interview with me. How do you know that you're not avoiding your personal responsibility? And people on the left go, no, I'm not avoiding my personal responsibility. He said, how do you know? Pay really close attention. Don't just dismiss it. How do you know? Because personal responsibility is an incredibly difficult thing to take. Like full personal responsibility for everything that you've done in your life. Really? And it was a kind of really interesting moment. It's like, yeah, how? That, that's a, a lifelong process. It is a lifelong process. And, and also, I, I think that it's... I think that the idea that we need to like fully mature and get to that place of self-actualization before we get to collective issues is it, it, it just given where we are in this moment in history, I, I think that that's not a good option. I think that we do radically need to do that inner work and it needs to express itself in really tackling global problems that we face. Um, and I, I also think that like some credit needs to be given that like it's easy to characterize the left as a bunch of materialists who haven't done inner work but like if you look at people in our circles there's lots of people who are doing lots of inner work and they are involved in broadly left-wing causes and they do can recognize when a group dynamic is getting toxic and I do think that there is a growing constituency that are, are doing both. And yeah, maybe that there is 
more of an emphasis on the, the systems change thinking and less on individual work and they haven't done a proper self-examination of their shadow but like you know you, you also have to work with what you have and I think that again I do think that it, in the in the kind of the evolution that the individual does on some level need to be recalibrated but then it's like right and then let's go or we or we'll have a pretty shitty context for the individual to operate in in 50 years yeah which is an interesting in one of the interviews we did with Jamie Wheel he made this comment about specifically identity politics because he has been involved in these kind of in these um, social change or um, really big projects and what he found was that they got taken down why he was he, he he describes it as he was very he assumed that everyone basically outside the alt right was kind of an, an okay guy or an okay person until they he basically said he was kneecapped from the left which he never expected and it was because the problem with identity politics is it stops you from even moving forward because if your axioms say well we can't move forward until we've got 100 percent representation we can't move forward until we've got we've made sure that every single voice is being heard we can't move forward until Da, da, da. The, the list is endless because the number of people that would need to be involved in this particular conversation would be, in, would be astronomical before you can even move forward. And I think that is the issue for me on the left, is that we have this very toxic worldview when it's taken to an extreme that actually is, is pretty much kneecapping a lot of the, 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 the sort of potential positive social movements. So again, I agree with you, like it's deconstructing by nature. It, it, it's art is in pointing out the flaws. Uh, it's kind of uh, in, inimicable to going out there initiating. There was a really good example of the Swedish Initiative, which was a new political party that um, is inspired by metamodern thinking. The New Yorker did a piece on them and they had just so much promise, so many talented people. And then it just it took a couple of voices to throw out like somewhat unsubstantiated accusations of sexist, misogynist behavior, and the, the whole project was just like torpedoed. And it's just so easy to do that. So I do recognize that. And also that there, it, you know, identity politics is a spectrum, and there is like really extreme versions that are like that. And there's also mature and thoughtful versions. And I think that like we have plenty of people who are really involved in intersectional activism, in identity politics in our circles. And like it is fascinating to to talk to them about like what does a mature thoughtful identity politics look like you know even just a simple um, like a shift in thinking from calling out to calling in so there has been a big culture of calling out you know white male privilege which essentially has been shaming and you know really negative towards a new culture of in a very sensitive way highlighting a person's experience of maybe being marginalized in a group setting, someone taking up too much space and calling it in. So like this, I think also uh, it's so easy to have this particular extreme caricature of identity politics. And also not to forget that it's, it serves the interest, from my perspective as someone on the left, it serves the interest of people who are on the far right and fascists for more and more and more of us to have this extreme caricature of identity politics and therefore to dismiss it and sideline it. And I think we have to be very careful about when we're talking about identity politics, just to uh, just at least to honor that there is a spectrum. See, I, I thought you were gonna make a different point there, which is that identity politics serves the far right. And I, it does, I think and it does. It does. Because this also, is the problem. Yeah, it does. What, I mean, basically the left is creating a situation where they're making your group identity the most important thing about you. And what is going to happen is the far, the far right are going to say, well, OK, then we'll play identity politics and we'll win because there's more of us. This is terrifying. Yeah, so I agree that, that it, it does fuel the right and the right plays on that by highlighting the caricature that more and more kind of mainstream soft left mm. liberal groups are now identifying with. Like, I think that there was a real cultural moment when Jonathan Pye did mm. his four minute brilliant comedy piece on uh, identity politics and you know there was that collective yes we can finally rip the shit out of this you know but also you know underneath it is like decades of genuine analysis uh, about um, the ways in which people experience advantage and disadvantage and we shouldn't be uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if you're really considering that very carefully, because it's very easy to wade in with very little understanding, take this kind of caricature and then go, 
we, you know, the left needs to get its house in order. And I think that that is... Um, yeah, but I, I, I mean, I, I think of sort of Eric and Brett Weinstein, because they're, they're both Bernie Sanders supporters, very kind of interesting thoughts about the left. And the first thing I'd sort of reframe it, and I think if, P, if Peterson talked about it like this, I think people would understand his kind of critiques of identity politics a little bit better. It's like, it's okay to, like, equality, fairness is a good value. If you make it your primary axiom, it leads to madness, which is what um, Eric Weinstein said. It's like, you cannot build a cosmology out of a theory of oppression. It leads to insanity, which is, which is I think, a good way of pulling it apart. It's like, no, these values that you hold, they are good. They are valuable. They need to be part of the conversation. If you make them your primary axioms, we've seen what happens in history. It, it generally turns into, turns into hell on earth. Mm. But... The other point, like I would say the left does need to get its house in order. Like I, I, I think what we are seeing at the moment is a kind of civil war within the left, where we had this kind of oppression narrative taking over until it's the only dialogue in town. So I do actually think that the left does need to put its house in order. And I think that's the healing that needs to happen. Like yeah. it, it, it really does need to be, which is why I think what you're doing as well with, the, with kind of uh, making films about Jordan Peterson and saying how something useful to offer the left is a really valuable conversation to have. Yeah, so I agree. The left does need to get its house in order and maybe, again, bring in the, the principle or the frame you brought in at the beginning, which is how do we include and transcend rather than rejecting? And I do think it, it does involve doing the work of really listening to that experience and, 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 and honouring not just the caricature, but actually the real genuine analysis and genuine sentiment that's there, while also recognising it is hostile to... A, like a genuine empirically driven intellectual inquiry. It is a divisive narrative that, ha that pits everyone as oppressors and oppressed. It is an individualizing narrative that balkanizes political groups. Like all of those things are deeply problematic if we want to bring people on board a vision of transition. We share a kind of focus on sort of spiritual development. As, as, as sort of politics through a sort of spiritual lens and through a personal growth, personal development lens. And I've often thought that kind of, and, and I, I guess we both share a kind of scepticism towards materialism. Like I, I have a real scepticism towards materialism. I think, it's, I think it's a really sort of, it saps the soul out of the world. And I think it's, that ultimately I think is what we're, part of the crisis we're seeing at the moment is a crisis of materialism. Mm -hmm. It's a crisis of all of these kind of things falling apart at the same time. Um, and implicit for me in what Peterson is saying is an acknowledgement of that and it's a kind of like a lot of the, cri the most intractable social crises that we're seeing say I use the example of the opioid crisis in America where you have an incredible number of people like self-numbing because they can't for me it's like it's the, mo it's the spiritual emptiness of late stage capitalism that's making a lot of our social crises worse and I think implicit in a lot of what Peterson is saying is an acknowledgement of that and I think if he was to make that explicit and say, yeah, a lot of the crises we're seeing are spiritual crises, not material crises. Mater the material realm is actually a subset of the, the realm of the soul and the realm of the being. Mm -hmm. And he does believe that because I asked him and he said yes, but he doesn't say that. And I think if he was to say that, if he was to frame his message in that way, I think a lot of people on the progressive left would suddenly say he, he is saying the same thing that we're saying. Because I think he is, but I think he's got so caught into this reactivity against identity politics that a lot of things he could be saying that would allow more people to see him as an ally are swallowed up. And, and in a way that, you know... Do, do, do you resonate with that? Do you think that's... That, would, would you, if he said that, would that be something you'd agree with? Yeah, I would absolutely resonate with it. Like, this is one of the reasons why we compared him and contrasted him with Russell Brand. This is essentially the message that Russell Brand has been bringing. Russell Brand when he gave that famous interview with Jeremy Paxman was saying, I'm not voting because actually what we need is a spiritual revolution. And he talks again and again about how our society makes us addicted, makes us mentally unwell and keeps us from flourishing. Like that is the fundamental political diagnosis for me. But I do think that to rectify that, there is a certain amount of material conditions that need to be there that does require what might be deemed as progressive adjustments to policy, to things like equality. And I think that's potentially where, let's say, more people on the left or me and Peterson would diverge. And, um, and, and maybe we can watch this and then we can analyze that afterwards.
And the sticking point that I hear a lot from my sort of more progressive friends is your sort of primary focus is on the individual. Yeah, well, that's that's too bad for them because no, the no, primary no, no, focus no, no, should no, be on the individual. No, no, I, I, I can agree with that. What, what I, the, the paradox, that they would say it's like, okay, focus on the individual, but you have to accept that there are some situations that are much more conducive to an individual thriving than other situations. And so their focus is on structural inequality, your focus is on the individual. Is there not some interplay between Oh, definitely. Two? Well, obviously, because people do have group identities. The question is whether whether the group or the individual identity should be paramount. And the leftist answer, the radical leftist answer is, well, there is, the, look, it's not me that's failing to take into account those two levels of analysis. It's the bloody radical leftists, because for them, it's the collective, and that's that. And so it's obvious, as far as I'm concerned, that people have their individuality, and then behind that, they have their, they have their group I, multiple group identities, which is also a big problem but conceptually also for the left. Or any of these situations that make it much more difficult for people to self-actualize. Mm -hmm. what, what I think they'd argue is they don't hear you talk about that very much. Well, it isn't. First of all, it's not self-evident. Like I'm not, I don't accept Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't think it's necessarily more difficult for people who are poor to self-actualize. Sorry, I don't buy that. You, because what that would mean, think about what that would mean. That would mean that the rich are morally superior. That's what that means, because they have all the opportunities to self-actualize. So obviously, if the material conditions are the prerequisite for self-actualization, then the rich are morally superior to the poor. Is that really an argument we want to make? And in, in fact, I don't think that that's even, even vaguely reasonable, because one of the things that does help build character is privation. Now, obviously, starving to death is an, an excess of privation. So there are limit conditions, but um, the, it, it's a leftist trope that the provision of additional material resources will produce ethically superior human beings. Sorry, not true. And in fact, sometimes quite the contrary. So, so, um, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy that argument in the least. Um, I also think that under most circumstances, accepting those of exceptional privation, and even perhaps under those conditions, in most, in most cases, your best bet to move people forward is to concentrate on the development of their individual character and their individual, their individual moral character. And because moral character is actually, your moral character is actually the set of tools that you have to operate effectively in the world. Because otherwise morality would be of no utility. And morality is, in some sense, precisely that which which is of maximal utility. And so, and, and the other objection that I would throw out at the radical left is, well, how do you know that your, oh, your emphasis on collective uh, existence isn't just an abdication of your personal responsibility? Well, of course it's not. It's like, no, 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 seriously here. It's not that easy to adopt personal responsibility, maximal personal responsibility. What makes you think you're not running away from it? You have every reason to. You're really of that stellar moral character. Really, that's, that's your self-analysis. It's like, sorry, I don't buy it. And I especially don't buy it when I look at the consequences of leftist revolutions. Because all these people of stellar moral character, when they undertake their collectivist revolution, nothing comes out of that but absolute bloody catastrophe. So, so all the well-meaning aims aside. I found this really interesting because implicit, I think even, and it, and it really landed for me when Peterson made this comparison with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is kind of the simplified way of saying, okay, once you've got your material needs set, then you can move up to your social needs. And then at the top is like self-actualization. So he's sort of saying you need to have many of the other things put together before you can move to self-actualization. And Peterson was challenging that and saying, no, because then what you're basically saying is self-actualization, like moral virtue, moral kind of, um, yeah, moral virtue is only available to people at the top of society, which I'd never heard before and actually kind of floored me when I heard it. What did you make of it? Well, I think that he is right, that it, it's not that we give everyone we make society more material equally equal and then all of a sudden everyone is self-actualizing. That's, that's simply not true. 
uh, very wealthy sectors of society can stunt development as much as very poor areas of society because they have cultures in a way that are inimical to, to growth. Um, so I would say that it's not an either or, it's about, it's about understanding the optimal level of support and of challenge. Both of those things are really important. So people who are in uh, potentially more deprived settings might have adversity that is hugely character building. But if it's too much adversity, if literally there's an, just an overwhelming set of constraints on the individual, it far from inducing growth, it, is, it can be suboptimal for any kind of development. I think that there's a basic, with a spiritual progressive political critique uh, of this, is the idea that we do need more, there is material conditions for really spiritually and psychologically growing. A lot of them are just around having the time and the space and the freedom to reflect on ourselves, even just to be able to do courses. Like I think about like some of the core things that have made a difference to my development. Doing a Vipassana, that's a 10 day meditation. That is a luxury if you are working on a minimum wage in two jobs to take 10 days off. If you've got two children, that is a complete privilege and luxury of time and space. I did an ayahuasca ceremony in Peru. That is a complete luxury of having enough money to fly to the other side of the world where ayahuasca is legal and do it there. So I think that like there are, if we think about in our spiritual progressive culture, it is a very privileged space. It's a very, it's this, all of these workshops that you can do from shadow work to tantra, all of which cost an arm and a leg to most people. And that is a, that is a purely material, material barrier to entry to uh, higher levels of development and growth. And so uh, for me, that's where, it, that's where it comes from, is that if, if you, if, you know, yes, 12... It's also about what you want to prioritise in your life as well. Yeah, there is, there is individual agency. And, that, and if you really, really do want to grow, you could be in any place and you could get to a better place. And I think Peterson does talk about how we use our social context, our culture, uh, our society as an excuse to actually be like, get your fucking shit together, like do it. But at the same time, if we're thinking about a society, how do we like to run society? We would like, like for us in Alter Ego, we, our vision is a deliberately developmental society. All institutions from family, community, health service, legal justice system, the economy itself is geared towards the development of the self. Does that mean that we radically redistribute everyone so everyone has the same? Well, no, if the empirical research proved what Peterson is saying, which is that that, that isn't the correct conditions. But, I but do that's a materialist, you're, you're then imposing a materialist frame on that. I'm saying that there's... If you're, a, if you're talking about distributing material goods. To the degree that I think that there does need to be a certain material threshold to give people literally... So like universal bank of in, basic income or something like that? Uh, yeah, that, that might be an example. Like it's, it's used as an example of how it helps with job matching in the economy, where people just have more time and space to go, hmm, what's the next best move? Do I go for this job or do I take some education? Whereas currently, there's literally no time and space. You just get the next job if you're in a lower rung of society. So, you know, progressive employment law, the amount of hours that you have to work, the amount you're paid, all of these things, like I, I see it as, do you have cognitive bandwidth to engage in deeper levels of inquiry, to engage in your own development? Mm -hmm. um, it's so so and it's a it's a hopefully a yes and or a both and it's saying for me spiritual and psychological growth is a priority there is a material dimension that requires a progressive politics to really challenge uh, particularly vested interests that are hoarding lots of money and that needs to be distributed i guess my perspective would be what what came up when i was hearing you talk was just a sort of sense that I think that the blocks, there's, there's, what, what I was hearing was a certain kind of sense of if we just gave people enough space, they would make better decisions. I have a sense that the kind of the, the psychological traps that we create for ourselves are often much deeper than that. And so for me, I guess the sort of going beyond, like, like I, th I think Peterson's focus on the individual is absolutely necessary. Like it's, a, it's the right place to start. And if you're going to have a set of axioms, empowering the individual and starting from a place of like radical personal responsibility or radical kind of self self awareness, and there's a kind of humility as well. What I really like about Peterson as well 
is there's a real humility in accepting that you don't know, that what you don't know is as important as what you do, and a real sense of kind of respect for that, which I think is really valuable compared to like, for example, the Sam Harris's or the materialists, which is sort of like, no, we know everything or we can work everything out. So I think there's a, there's a sort of starting point. I think it's, I think it's the right place to start. I, I think what's really helped me is like personal growth. Um, didn't get quite so much from ayahuasca, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely there are there are things that I got a lot a lot from in terms of personal growth and therapeutic interventions, and I think giving people that is really important. Mm. Um, I know, for example, my I'll digress slightly. My my mother and my father had very I was I was brought up in a very left wing house. My father was very sort of um, straight down the line. Guardian, re they both read the Guardian. They were both sort of Guardian reading, CND marching people. My mum went through a process of real um, difficulty. She started working in a, in a poor school in Southampton. And what she found really difficult, so she had a lot more interactions with the actual, like they both wanted to help the, 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 the downtrodden, the, the poor. What in, my dad in a very sort of abstract way, my mum in a very real kind of working in one of the most deprived areas and schools in Southampton. She had something of a, of a real awakening because what she realized was that a lot of the parents didn't necessarily want their kids to succeed on a, on a subconscious level not not outwardly mm -hmm. but she would be kind of seeing something in this child like wow you could you could go to university and the parents would come in and like no uh, the system's biased no my, my child none of us have been to university and and really found this kind of like either 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 conscious or subconscious like because if their child succeeded it would challenge them their sense of themselves the fact that the system was biased against them the fact that the world didn't work for people like them all this stuff and it happens at such a subconscious level and this is what i see as the real difficulty with like the real value of, of psychological growth and real sort of psychological intervention is that it can potentially shift some of those paradigms mm. but the real difficulty and the real problem with the left is that it equates poverty or oppression with moral virtue and that's a real issue because if you do that what you don't realize and the, the paradox of most people on the left is that they love the poor in the abstract but they hate them in the, in the particular and they hate everything they believe they hate everything they think they hate the nationalism they hate all of the things that they actually think so it's like for me for me i think we all have our shadows and i think the shadow of like what we're seeing at the moment with brexit and trump is the shadow of liberalism is like the shadow of, yeah, we're really inclusive apart from all these people we hate. So for me, the psychological growth work needs to happen everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see, I, I, I think we all have our psychological traps in, in every area of, of society. Like the liberals have their psychological traps and it's now coming to bite them in the arse with, with, with Brexit and Trump. And, and there are, yeah, so I see it as a more complex thing. And I think that message of personal responsibility, like really, really identify your resentments. Mm -hmm. Really do the work of, of really looking at where you're, where you're holding back or where you're judging people. or where, And we all have this. I think that's the right place to start for me. I still think Peterson is the right place to start because if you don't, then your shadows are going to be sort of manifest in everything that you're doing. Yeah, and I think that maybe what I hear in that, um, what you're saying is that you, and Peterson is saying as well, you can't just throw money at a culture of, you know, underachievement or lacking and taking personal responsibility. It'll just continue. You re and like, and, and how do you actually intervene at any level, whether it's like a culture of underachievement in poorer parts of society, if it's like a culture of moral superiority in liberal circles. But I, I do think that maybe the future is a, is a combination of both. So I'll just give you an, just a practical example. In the the RSA uh, wrote a, a report on basic income, and it wasn't just getting like the actual numbers right about how much to distribute. It was also putting together a conditional response mechanism where people would voluntarily contribute in the community in society in exchange for the money. So it wasn't an, it wasn't like you're not going to get the money until you do it, but there was a certain set of interventions that would create the conditions for people to more likely to experience a kind of a more service oriented citizenship led identity in the absence of work in the future where there's full automation. So I do think that um, 
maybe there's a switch. So sort of generosity and boundaries at the same time, which yeah. is a, a, the issue that we often have. Often yeah, find. and 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 again, but I do think you can have a, you know, a, let's say for example, a welfare state that really emphasizes psychological growth work that isn't just about healing, but it is about get your shit together. But there is resources to do it, which is generally speaking more likely to come from the left and from progressives who believe in actually investing in public services. So again, it's how do we marry this really important message about individual responsibility to break through these very entrenched cultures and how do we actually galvanize, broadly speaking, left-wing and progressive sources to actually fund it and to make it happen. And that's, yeah. for me, I think, the, the opening that I see with Peterson. I think in this and other conversations we've had, we've clearly got sort of different, like we, we have different priorities in terms of kind of our, our perspectives, like personal responsibility or, or social change. But I think we ultimately come from the same place in that we, like I, I definitely believe in the value of, of structure. I believe in the value of government. I believe that a political project based around personal growth has a real chance of succeeding. Like I really do think that that's something that's worth, worth having and then holding the tension of, but it comes down to the individual responsibility at the same time. Mm. And this kind of realization of, okay, we need to give people the opportunities, but ultimately we can't encourage people to take them. Yeah, and just an overcoming of the developmental blindness of policy. Like what a bankrupt idea to think if we just threw more money into the welfare state at a stands that that would be able to tackle a cultural issue. Like it's a joke. It's more that we need serious psychological support and psychological intervention to equip people to support themselves on their own journey of becoming. So it is, again, it, it is, it's something that is enabled by a, a collective decision to really pool resources in a certain area, but with an emphasis on actually where it is likely to be effective, which is at the individual psychological and even spiritual level, if we can manage to get there. Ronan. Thank you very much. Thank you.